Hey, good evening, everybody. Glad you could join us for some Bible study tonight. If you have your Bibles, you might want to find the book of Acts. And if you haven't already done so, I hope you'll download the study notes. Actually, I put all the scriptures, and we're going to be going through a lot of scriptures in Acts, just hopping from chapter to chapter. But uh, uh, if, you, if you have a chance to download that or even put it up on your screen, uh, that, would be, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, wow. What a world we're living in. I just uh, got the word today from my wife that uh, school has been canceled for the rest of the year. I, I think they're still going to do some, uh, at least in her school, some uh, Zoom type of classroom uh, stuff with kids, but they're not coming back for the rest of the year uh, to school. So what a, what a tough thing for, for kids, for teachers, for uh, when I think about all the opportunities of, think of a senior in high school, they'll miss their prom. They'll miss their walking across the stage for graduation. Uh, all, those, uh, all those events in, in, in people's lives that uh, have changed. Um, so, hey, listen, we're ready to jump into to God's word. I hope you downloaded that. Let's have a prayer and we'll jump in. Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts, and the witness of Holy Scripture cause um, some type of revelation to take place in our lives that would transform our lives and uh, to somehow conform us more to the image of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, one of my lesser flaws is that I can get absent-minded and I fail to look at the gas gauge in the car. I have gotten that gauge down so low that when I went, went in to pump up at the station, you know, I, it, it, it was amazing uh, that I even got into the station. When Kathy and I moved here to LA uh, almost 10 years ago. Uh, we bought a, a Prius, a Toyota Prius, because of the great gas mileage that it gets. And it not only has a blinking bar that lets you know that you're low on fuel, but if you don't fill up, there's a little bell that dings and it reminds you, bing, time to fill up. And if you still don't fill up, there's this woman's voice that comes from the passenger seat next that says, Time to fill up the tank, honey. We have propane, uh, propane gas grill, and honestly, sometimes it never occurs to me to check it out. I'll take that thing down to bone dry. There'll be meat on the grill. There's company in on the dining at the dining room table before I'll even think about getting that that uh, tank filled. Now, the reason that I bring this up is that human beings. Uh, like cars and like propane tanks, uh, we have a fuel tank. It's, it's, in, it's in our inner spirit. It's in our inner being. You know, some people are alive. You can just see the fire in their eyes. Other people, their eyes are just kind of glazed over. And you look at their shoulders. I mean, some people are walking with their shoulders square and they're straight, and other people are hunched over. Some people are marching while other people are trudging. And, and we all have fuel tanks. Everybody does. And there are some people who, when you're with them, they just fill up your, your tank. It, when you're with certain people, they breathe life into you. They remind you what a good God our God is. And they call you to, to live to the best that you can be. And when you're with them, your anxiety goes down and your hope and your sense of trust and your faith goes up. There was a, a fourth century monk by the name of Gregory. He was from Nyssa. He's one of the early church fathers and he painted a beautiful picture of this, this kind of living. Uh, this is what he writes. At horse races, the spectators, intent on victory, shout to their favorites in the contest. From the balcony, they incite the rider to keener effort, urging the horses on while leaning forward and flailing the air with their outstretched hand instead of a whip. By the way, I'd say that uh, Father Gregory there spent a little too much time at the racetrack for an early church father. Anyway, here's how he takes the picture to a conclusion. I seem to be doing the same thing myself, he writes, most valuable friend and brother. While you are competing admirably in the divine race, 
straining constantly for the prize of the heavenly calling, I exhort, urge, and encourage you vigorously. You know, there's a phrase that's been around for a long time, and it describes this kind of thing. It talks about somebody who is a balcony person. It was Florence Littenauer who coined that phrase, but I think she got it from my grandma Dixie. Gregory says, I'm up in the stands. I'm watching my friend run the race, and I'm cheering him on. And some people do that for you, don't they? They're your fans in the stands. And when you're with them, they just fill your tank. There's a golfer by the name of Betsy King, and when she was inducted into the uh, World Golf Hall of Fame down in St. Augustine, Florida, Amy Alcott, who was another professional golfer, gave her induction speech. And here's what Amy said. Whenever I'm with Betsy, I feel better about myself. Isn't it great to have somebody like that in your life? When you're not look, but there's other people who, when you're not looking, they kind of stick a, a hose in your tank. They take a deep breath and they siphon all the fuel out. They drain the life out of you. And these would be called basement people because they bring you down. I, I heard a great story that illustrates this point. There was a man who was a hunter and, uh, uh, he had a friend who was never impressed with anything that he did, never got excited for him about anything. Well, one day he got a new hunting dog, and it was a fabulous dog. It can scent things that were miles away. It can point for an hour without moving. So he takes his friend, uh, over, he takes his dog over to his friend's house to show him his new dog. And of course, the friend is not impressed. Well, the climatic moment comes when he shoots a duck and the duck lands on the pond and he sends his duck to get, get the duck or dog to get the duck. The dog stops at the top or, or stops, walks on the top of the water, fetches the duck and brings it back trotting on top of the water. He turns to his friend thinking, at least now my friend will be impressed. But instead, the friend shakes his head and says, your dog doesn't know how to swim, does he? Have you ever heard of the Eeyore syndrome? These are Christians who walk around acting like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. They choose to look at the gloomy side of life. Their countenance is cheerless and they have no enthusiasm and no anticipation of life. Uh, William Ward, writes about these discouraging people. Here's what he says. They're dissatisfied with the past, distaste for the present, distrust the future. It is, he continues, ingratitude for the blessings of yesterday, indifference to the opportunities of today, and insecurity regarding tomorrow. It is an unawareness of the presence of beauty, an unconcern for the needs of others, and an unbelief in the promises of old. It is impatience with time, immaturity of thought, and impoliteness to God. Littenauer writes this, joy suckers take on all shapes and sizes, but most often they are negative in their outlook, disappointed with their family, in need of attention, or enamored with their own power, and somewhere along the way they have been allowed to get away with unacceptable behavior. And then she concludes, because they are not happy people, they are determined that others should not be happy either. So they are critical, fault-finding, and contentious. I, I, I bet if you closed your eyes for a few seconds, you would probably see every joy sucker that you've ever known. Because we all have those kinds of people in our lives. People who are joy challenged, they're dream squashing, they're fault finding, they're slow leaks in the, in the hot air balloon of life. Now we're to love them, but we have to guard our hearts. And all of us have the potential to become basement people for other people. You know, there's a basement person inside of every one of us, but that's not God's plan for human life. The church isn't supposed to be a place where we come once a week and we sit in a service, although that's the way many people in our culture think about it. 
It, it's, it's about doing life together. Everybody here is running the race of his or her life, and we're all to be in the stands cheering on our brothers and sisters in the race because we've got only this one race, and this is it, and we need balcony people to cheer us on. And when that happens in real life, encouragement, correctly understood, is the language of the New Testament. You know, the word encourage is used more than a hundred times in the Bible. One of the great characters of the Bible, uh, possibly the patron saint of balcony people, is a guy named Barnabas, and that's who we're going to look at tonight and see a little about his life. We find, uh, find out most about him in the book of Acts. So let's look at him and see what kind of people uh, you or I could be. And here's how the story starts. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 36. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, sold a field that, he, field that he owned, and he brought the money, and he put it at the apostles' feet. Now, Joseph is a Levite. Levites were one of the 12, 12 tribes of Israel, and in that day, in the old days, they were uh, assistants to the priest. They could be the doorkeepers of the temple. They could have been the musicians. But Joseph could not do these things because he was from Cyprus, and he hadn't been born in Israel. He was what was called a Hellenist. And Hellenists were Israelites who were born outside or out of the country of Israel. They were regarded, therefore, as foreigners. They didn't speak Aramaic, which is the native-born Israelite uh, language. They were considered to have picked up the defiled and foreign Gentile ways. And we know from Acts chapter 6 that there's a lot of hostility between native-born Israelites and the Hellenists. So Joseph is not allowed to serve in the temple like Levites normally would do. You might expect him to be a little bitter about this, a little sour perhaps. He becomes a part of this new community, this Christian community, and he becomes a balcony guy. He sees a need, he sees poverty, and he says, hey, I've got some property. I could sell some of this stuff and I could help some people out with it. He is the first recorded donor in the church, in church history, in this new community. Now you think of all the universities and the missions and the churches over the centuries and the billions of dollars that have been given and this is the guy who started it. He doesn't do it to be a big shot. The text says he put the money at the apostles' feet. And the idea that's being expressed here is you guys will know what to do with it. No strings attached. You don't have to build a building with my name on it. Just use it to bless people. I I'm, I'm telling you there is an encouragement when somebody gives, just simply gives. No strings attached. My daughters were uh, with a couple of their roommates from college a couple of years ago. They were driving back through Las Vegas and they stopped in a, in a restaurant to have lunch. And uh, this couple is sitting across from them. And when the couple got up to leave, the gentleman came over and he slammed his hand down on the table. And he said, I noticed that you girls prayed before you ate your meal. And I just wanted to commend you for it. And he turned and he walked away. And when he pulled his hand away, there was a $20 bill to help pay for their lunch. They felt so encouraged. And when you're a college kid, you're pretty grateful. There was nothing strategic in it for them. They were never going to, they wouldn't even know who their names were. So some of you, you know the joy of simply giving and the joy of thinking, I've got something and I could just give it away. And some of you haven't given. Uh, others of you have given sacrificially. And I'm telling you that when you put yourself in touch with a spiritual power like that, when that happens, an odd thing happens uh, in a sense. You become connected to the deeper realities of the kingdom, that it's more than money. People who give, even though they have less money, they worry less about money than other people who don't give. But you'd think it'd be the other way around, wouldn't you, that they'd worry more? Because when giving begins, you never know what will happen. You put yourself in the flow of a reality that's so much bigger than you are. 
So the man named Joseph does this. It's the spirit that he gave that became infectious. And some of you already know that. Some of you could speak by experience. Uh, the disciples say, hey, listen, Joe is not an adequate name for this guy. We're going to have to call him by a new name. We're going to call him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And from now on, whenever he hears that name, he thinks, that's who I am. That's who I want to be. And so he encourages the community, and the community encourages him, and the encouragement just kind of spirals up, and that's how encouragement works, and that's how giving works. And then Barnabas disappears, and the next time we see him is in Acts chapter 9. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 9 or look at your study notes there. It says there's a man named Saul who's been terrorizing the followers of Christ. Verse uh, 1, chapter 9 breathing out murderous threats, finding men and women to take as prisoners. And then what happens is Saul meets Jesus, and, and it's a very dramatic story. He repents, he trusts Jesus, he believes, but then there's a problem. Look at, uh, look at verse 26 of, of Acts 9. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the, the apostles. He told them how Saul had, on his journey, had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Paul comes to Jerusalem. They don't believe he's really a disciple because he's murdered their friend Stephen. He's threatened people. He's persecuted and imprisoned and killed their husbands and wives and brothers and sisters. So how could they know that his conversion was real and that he wasn't just trying to get inside their group to maybe even damage it more? No one was going to touch Paul with a 10-foot pole. No one was that dumb. Do you ever remember years ago that old oatmeal commercial, cereal commercial? Uh, two brothers, they're supposed to try this new cereal because their mom tells them that it's really good for them. And one says to the other, you try it. And the other says, no, no, I'm not going to try it. You try it. No, I'm not going to try it. And they keep shoving the bowl back and forth. And then they have an idea. And they look at their younger brother and they both say, let's get Mikey to try it. So Saul comes in to Jerusalem. He says, I'm one of you guys now. This is the guy that's been dragging him off to prison. The disciples say, I'm not going to touch him. You do it. No, I'm not going to touch him. I've got an idea. Let's let Barnabas try it. Barnabas will like anybody. And so they send Barnabas to check this guy out. And balcony people have a wonderful gift. They believe that with God's help, you can change. They don't let who you were yesterday limit who you might be today or who you might become tomorrow. And this is a fabulous gift. Barnabas is willing to take a risk on Saul. He becomes his friend. He gets to know him. He has an inclination to believe the best and to see the best and to call out the best. And he goes to his brothers and sisters and he says, you know this, Saul? Look at how, how his life has changed. Look at what happened to him between, in his meeting God. Look how he's devoting his life to the gospel. Take it from me. This man can be trusted. And because Barnabas said he could be trusted, the disciples embraced Saul. And so we're told in Acts 9.28, Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. Have you ever thought of what would have happened had Saul not had a Barnabas? His acceptance into the Christian community is the result of the actions of one balcony person who gave him the wonderful gift of starting over. And I believe you can do that for somebody. Well, at the end of the story, there's a wonderful summary of verse 31 of chapter 9. And then the, the church throughout Judea, Galilee, Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers living in the fear of the Lord. And so now Barnabas disappears again until another critical moment in church life. Look at chapter 11, verse 20. 
some from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch, and they began to speak to, to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Now, you have to really grasp the drama of this moment. In fact, this is a huge turning point in world history. Up until this point, the good news about Jesus had spread essentially among Jewish people. But this is where some daring soul says, if it's good for Israel, maybe it would be good for the Gentiles as well. Maybe it would be good for the whole world. All through the centuries in the history of Israel, this had never happened. That barrier had never really been crossed. And somebody said, let's try a new experience. Let's tell the Gentiles. And amazingly, these Gentiles who don't know Torah, who don't know Israel, they respond. And they begin to enter into this new Jesus community. And the first major city outside of Israel where the Jesus movement begins to take root is in this city, Antioch. It's a little north of Israel in Syria. And, and the way that this news gets back to, to Jerusalem is... Uh, they kind of get word that this Jews, Jesus movement is spreading. It's kind of going Gentile. And we're not so sure about this. And if we let the Gentiles in, it could change everything. By the way, have you noticed that religious communities are not always welcome to change? I, I grew up in a Presbyterian church, and we loved innovation and adventure. Change, not you know how many Presbyterians it takes to change a light bulb? Change? Who said anything about change? No, in a sense, everything hinges on this question. Who is the community at Jerusalem going to send to check out what's happening in Antioch? Well, you guessed it, they sent Barnabas. I mean, isn't this just so Barnabas? Look at verse 23 of chapter 11. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man. And by the way, this is the only time this description is used in the book of Acts about somebody being a good man. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. In fact, so many people were brought to the Lord. There's so much spiritual opportunity going on here that it is in Antioch where it says in Acts chapter 14, verse 27, God opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So God is a God of open doors and of spiritual opportunity. And Barnabas realizes he's going to need some help here. He's going to need somebody to deal with this opportunity, somebody who knows the scriptures, somebody who can speak to the Gentiles, somebody who has great courage and great in, and energy, someone who is formidable and has a quick tongue. And then he remembers this young convert by the name of Paul some time ago. And I think this is ironic because uh, there's probably no one who's more Jewish than, than, than Saul. Uh, no one had more zeal for the Torah than Saul. And Barnabas says, I think there is something in him that, we, that could work here, that we could develop here. So that's how Saul would become Paul. Saul was the Jewish version of the name Paul, which was the Greek or the Gentile version. And, and he would become the great missionary to the Gentiles and, and ultimately to the rest of the world. And actually, Paul would change the world, but it only happened because of Barnabas. You see, balcony people can see things in others that nobody else sees, and sometimes those people can't see it in themselves. And by the way, I think as God opens doors here in the South Bay, our church, some of you might have the gift that Barnabas had. Some of you have the gift of being able to see the potential in other people and the spiritual opportunity and need. And you can connect people with areas of need. And we need churches that are full of people who, who have these Barnabas gifts. So Barnabas says, Paul, I want you to come with me and we'll do ministry together. And they do. And an interesting thing happens. 
You know, in the ancient world, it's pretty significant to look at the order of names uh, when the deeds of people are being recorded. Uh, the order tells you who's in charge, who's the boss, who carries the prestige of the mission. And we see this just like we would expect in, in the book of Acts. It says, for a whole year, Paul and Barnabas taught great numbers of people. Barnabas was the leader, followers of Jesus who lived outside of Jerusalem, it says in, uh, in verse 30 of, of chapter 11. They sent their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Paul. In Antioch, it says the Holy Spirit instructed the church leaders, uh, chapter 13, verse 2, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called for them. But something interesting happens in the process. Paul's gift begins, gifts begin to forge, and his maturity begins to blossom. And then look at Acts chapter 14, verse 1. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. Now, did you catch what happened there? The names have been switched. Now it's Paul who's mentioned first. And from a human standpoint, this is terrible. Barnabas has done a bad job of career management. He's not positioned himself properly. The mission has been such a big success, and he should be the one that's making sure that he's getting the credit for it. But that's not Barnabas. He could have been jealous. He could have longed for Paul's status, but instead he rejoices in it. And his joy is in recognizing and developing greatness in somebody else. And now Paul's ministry will go uh, far, become far more visible than his own, but nobody rejoices more about it than Barnabas does. He is a true balcony person. You know, Jesus said, this is how it's going to be. There is this kingdom, it's real, and the reality of the kingdom is that the last really are first, and the people who are servants are really the greatest. And that's what greatness is, and ultimately, that's what joy is. It's not clawing your way to the top of fame and recognition and money. The really, that really is, is not the deepest reality of the kingdom. But now there's going to be a, a community which this is going to be true. And in Barnabas, this is now true. Barnabas is a kingdom kind of guy. He's a balcony guy. And through him, up there is coming down. And so another wonderful redemptive things happens through him because balcony people have that kind of gift. So Paul and Barnabas would often travel with other folks they, that would help them develop their ministries. And that was part of who Barnabas was. And one of those people who traveled with them was a young man by the name of John Mark. We, we call him Mark. And we see a brief glimpse of him in the Gospel of Mark, which uh, he most likely wrote, where there's a story of a young man whose name isn't given, but at a key point before Jesus is crucified, he becomes afraid and he runs away and he deserts Jesus. And he runs and he leaves his cloak behind. And most biblical scholars believe this is probably Mark. So Mark comes back to faith. He travels with Paul and Barnabas to help them for a while. But look what we're told in Acts 13, 13. From Paphos, Paul and his companions, notice they don't even mention Barnabas anymore. He doesn't get his name listed. They sailed to Perga where John left them to return to Jerusalem. John Mark, that, that's who, who that would be. So he deserts them. But we don't know why. Look at verse 35. Paul says to Barnabas, let's go on another trip to strengthen the churches. Now notice this, verse 36. Barnabas wanted to take John, that's John Mark, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it was wise because he had deserted them. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company and Barnabas took Mark. Now, you know, we all probably realize that Paul was a pretty formidable guy. And to disagree with him or to confront him would take a lot of spine. Wouldn't you love to have been in on that conversation? I mean, I can imagine Barnabas saying, hey, pal, remember Jerusalem when nobody would touch you with a 10-foot pole because you'd done such awful things? Who was it that gave you a second chance? And now you're telling me that you're not going to give a second chance to John Mark? Well, 
I don't know that that conversation took place, but they part ways. And the Bible doesn't say that one of them was right and the other one was wrong, because often in the scripture, that kind of judgment will be made, but the Bible doesn't say that the Holy Spirit led them one way or the other. And sometimes, this is, this is um, as um, Holy Spirit practical as I can get, I think sometimes God wants for us to make the decision for us because then we grow. But we know that as part of what was probably the last letter that Paul wrote, he says in his letter to Timothy, chapter, chapter four, second Timothy, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you for he is helpful in my ministry. Isn't that interesting? Old Barnabas saw something in Mark and he turned out to be right all along. And the life of John Mark is one more of a tribute to the power of a balcony person. You know, Mark wrote uh, one of the Gospels, and most scholars think that the Gospel of Mark was the first one that was written, and that Matthew and Luke very well were drawing from some of Mark's writings for their Gospels as well. What if Barnabas had given up on Mark? Balcony people stand with you even when you fall. And the idea is, we're going to be each other's balcony people. And this is all over the New Testament. Encourage one another daily. Look what Hebrews 3.13 says, encourage one another daily so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So when we're not, not encouraged, sin just looks a lot better. Paul says, therefore, in 1 Thessalonians 5, therefore encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you're doing. And the writer of Hebrews says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And I think you could do that this week. You can say, this is gonna be a Barnabas week. You could do it with your small group. You could get online, you could email them, you could phone them, you could text them. I know you're not supposed to gather with them right now, but, uh, uh, and by the way, if you're not in a small group, I hope you get in one. And after Easter, we're going to start some new online small groups just so that people who haven't had a chance can connect. And uh, we'll be telling you more about that in the next couple weeks. And that's where you get this kind of encouragement from somebody. And by the way, if you're a small group leader, keep praying for each person in your small group and call out the best for each person in your small group. You be the Barnabas. You be the balcony leader. And this is not a human power trip. The main person who wants to be in your balcony cheering you on is Jesus. And if you'll ask him, and if you've never done it, by the way, just confess your sin and ask him, and he'll do that for you. He will run the race with you. He'll be your savior and your friend and your leader and your cheerleader. And that's what makes a life a balcony life. I don't know if you've ever thought about your funeral and what people might say at it someday. I was kind of wondering what Barnabas' funeral might be like. A man gets up to speak, and it's the Apostle Paul. And people start whispering and nudging each other, hey, that's the Apostle Paul, he's famous. And Paul says, you know, I persecuted the church. I put followers of Jesus to death or in prison. Nobody trusted me, nobody would touch me, and then Barnabas came along and he put his arm around me and he said, I'll vouch for him and I stand before you today because of a man named Barnabas. And then John Mark gets up. He's an old man and people nudge each other. He wrote the gospel, he's famous. And Mark says, the truth about me is I was a quitter. I'd run away from Jesus and I'd run away from ministry but Barnabas would not give up on me. He saw something in me. And I don't know why or what, but he took me under his wing and he said, I'll vouch for you. And I'm here today because of a man named Barnabas. Next, a Greek guy from Antioch gets up and he says, you know, I was a pagan. I was so far from God and I was so lost it wasn't funny. And then I heard about Jesus and I wanted in, but I didn't know the Torah. I could never be Jewish. I didn't fit in. And then Barnabas came along and he said that Jesus came for guys like me. 
and he put his arm around me and he said, I'll vouch for him. And I'm here today because of a man named Barnabas. And then an old widow gets up. Nobody nudges anybody else because they have no idea who she is. She's not famous. And she says, you know, I lost everything when my husband died. I had young children. I had no income. I didn't know if I'd make it. And then Barnabas came along and he quietly sold his own property so that I could have something to live on and so I could feed my children. And I'm here today because of a man named Barnabas. I want to tell you, friends, that's a kingdom funeral. That's the funeral of a man who never tried to be great. He just tried to call out greatness in others. But the spread of the gospel from one little ethnic group where it had been housed for centuries to the whole world, to you and me, to the writings of Paul and the writings of Mark and half the writings of the New Testament happened because one man stood in the balcony and he said, yeah, keep going. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. And in the kingdom, that's what greatness looks like. Well, that's enough for this evening. Let's pray together. Father, we bow in gratitude, not just for Barnabas, not just for Paul, not just for Mark, but for the person of Christ, who is our, our balcony person, who through his life and his death and his resurrection has not only uh, demonstrated, but has uh, eliminated the barriers that were there between us and has, um, has brought forgiveness, has paid the price that had to be paid for our sin. And now in that spirit, may we, because of the life of Christ in us, become balcony people to others. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I hope we'll see you on Sunday. Have a great week, bud.